Next up is Adam Twig from um, the Pyramid Hill Group. Adam uh, started working with us uh, about four years ago. Yeah, um, when we we started the started that group. Um, again, very similar to to Cos, basically somebody that knows his community well has a a strong background in agriculture in the region and indeed is a, is a farmer in that region and um, well known to his colleagues. So take it away, Adam. Um, yeah, well, thanks everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, no, Phil's probably ex yeah, explained how it happened. Phil set up a meeting for us there um, in late 14, September 14, I think. We had oh, roughly 10 people turn up to the meeting, all just keen to get a start um, and yeah everyone voted they wanted to start the group um, so uh, a so-called mate put my name up to do this job um, anyway after talking to the wife for a few days and stuff so sort I of thought oh well, it might be a good ticket to get out of shearing a bit and um, <laughs> good way to get get something happening in the group anyway so um, so I took it on so um, our group I believe is one of the bigger ones in the area size wise um, we've got people up as far far north as up and south, um, as far down as Midiabo south, and then pretty much the the Loddon River on the, is our west boundary, and across to almost Bendigo Creek. We've actually got one guy that's done a couple of things with us from yeah even further east of the Bendigo Creek, but we sort of say that's our area. Um, so we involve we've got a, yeah, we've got a big area, and we've got a bit of variety. Probably not as much as some of the others. The the bulk part of our area, for that, most of you probably know it, is just flat, open plains, um, red, red loamy clay soils down to heavy black clay soils, except for the um, except for the hill, the, the red patches there, which is where Pyramid gets its name of. There's a there yeah, the Terrick Range there, and that's got the lighter, sandier sort of soil. Um, a lot of the rest of us are a bit envious of that stuff, but it has its challenges as well. Um, Enterprises, it's a wide range. The, the big ones are our, our cereal cropping and cropping and, and sheep are the big ones, but because we've got the irrigation, large larger percentage of it's irrigation, we've got, there's a few dairies, um, there's a bit of horticulture, we've got pigs, um, irrigated cropping as well, a um, fair bit of summer cropping, loosen, um, and pastures, irrigated pastures, sheep and cattle and things like that. So we've got a wide variety of enterprises and I guess that makes it a little bit tricky in trying to keep everyone happy in the group. But um, yeah, we've done our best. Um, I, I've got, we, we had a bit of a template for our um, slides, so you're going to see a lot of the same ones as what Cos had. But um, our, our constraints, like everyone, sodic soils, um, Salinity was a big one. Pyramid was capital of salt for many years. It has improved in the last 20. I can remember as a kid having 20 acre patches that were just dead bare. Go out and skitter around the ute on them and stuff. Um, and you'd, you'd dig a post hole and it'd half fill with water. Uh, well, there's none of that anymore. All that country, you can now grow some degree of crops on even that, that bare country now. Um, I can go into why that is, but dry seasons, being able to trade your water instead of you know, it'd come to this time of year and people go, I've still got 500 megs left and I've paid for it, I'm going to splash it around so there'd be water lying everywhere. So being able to trade that water's probably helped a lot and I guess it was the CNA behind digging a lot of the drains, cleaning drains out and stuff to, to get any excess water away has probably helped a lot too. So, so a lot of that stuff has helped in the past um, get things up, but yeah, we still wanted, still got a lot of improving to do. Uh, same as costs, we've got shallow root zones, hostile subsoils, Salt's got a lot to do with that, um, but we also have limestone calcium carbonate layers and gypsum layers as well that roots don't seem to like going through. Um, and we found that um, with Christian Bannon, same thing, anywhere from I think 25 centimetres was our shallowest soil down to I think there was a 70 or an 80 centimetre, but we're really working between 30 and 60 centimetres of, of root zone we've got. And straight away that that said to me, he explained why, you'd, uh, you know, in a dry spring, you'd have a crop that would be looking all right, and then all of a sudden it would just curl over and die. So obviously once that top root zones run out of moisture, 
the roots can't get down into that hostile zone and they, draw, they, they die off. So that's, just knowing that helps, helps you manage what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's basically what we've done there. Um, I wish this guy was here so I could give him crap about being an ugly bugger, but um, we, we've start, basically we started with um, Christian Bannon, same as Cost did. Uh, he came and dug a, a same deal, two pits on every farm. I think he did 50 pits the first year and another 10 the next year with some new people that came on board. Um, so I spent three days going around digging pits and as I said yesterday on the bus, my wife was rude enough to have a baby two weeks early, which meant I missed all of that. Um, so I saw about three or five pits, I think, dug out of the 50 myself. So one of the other guys in the group went around and with Christian and showed him the way around and got, got the benefit of seeing all the soils and, and what you look for. Um, Christian then took samples himself, some went down to laboratories and some he did himself, just dispersion tests and EC tests and stuff he could do himself. And he came and did a workshop at the pub one night and um, yeah, just told us you know, what the general state of our soils was. And yeah, again, pretty handy stuff to know what we're up against and that we're all sort of facing the same thing at different different levels. Um, so, yeah, I guess yeah, where I'm going to spend most of my time annoying you is telling you what we've been up to. Um, so, our workshops and field days thing, um, well, there again is Doris, Doris Blessing. Um, we've had her up twice. She's fantastic. Um, you know, she can engage all the farmers and she's, she's got pretty much all the answers. I don't think I saw her get stumped very often but she could still explain it in a way that everyone could understand. It wasn't, wasn't too complicated. So she's, she was fantastic. The first time she came, we went to Grant's place as well. Um, I don't know how Grant gets any work done with all us buggers visiting him, but that's, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, it was great to see. And then to have Doris there as well to, to, um, you know, to be able to ask some of the more technical questions about how it all works and everything. Um, yeah, everyone had a great, great time out of doing that. Um, We've had San Jolly as well. Um, I haven't got lots of photos of it, so you're going to have to just listen to me. Um, same deal. Cost said everything you need to say about San. She was great um, talking about livestock and how to, how to feed them properly and, but maintaining cover on your paddocks so you don't, your paddocks don't blow. And how to, so then if, if it is getting tight, how to containment feed them so, and still do it profitably. Um, so you can keep that cover on your paddock as opposed to just flogging it down to bare dirt, um, which yeah, is pretty tempting for a lot of people because it's easier. So she got a lot of people thinking pretty well and I think we might have even got one or two people that have taken her on um, personal consulting wise. So it's, it's good in that way. Um, we've had Jim Shovelton. Um, he's a yeah, pasture guru. Uh, we just came and did some pasture walks and looked at a couple of different ways guys establish their pastures and and manage them and um, yeah you could just you know tell us where we could, what we can do better and what's done well and yeah it was just good for people to get out and see what other farmers are doing and how they're doing it and what works for them um, and like Cos said that's just a good way of, of people being able to to see what's happening. Uh, who else have we had? Neil Hives um, I think some of the other groups have had as well, uh, entomologist. We got him up just to talk about, this was in the spring, um, beneficial insects and managing our pests. Um, well, again, <laughs> a lot of what Grant's doing, um, looking at that sort of stuff. But it was great to have him there to show, like we went out in the paddock and did tests and did sweeps and stuff, and but having someone there just to show you what, which one of these bugs is beneficial and and what it does and who it attacks and all those sort of things. I'd, yeah, I know I learned a lot out of it. Um, and just, yeah, the, the way, again, Grant's already covered on it, but there's other ways of dealing with your pests rather than just chucking a broad spectrum lamat on them or something like that. So the, the fact that there's other options out there and, um, yeah, the chemicals that you can use that'll only hurt a lot narrower range. I won't say it'll only kill the pests, but it's not going to hurt as many of our beneficials. So. Things like that are certainly worth looking at, and the guys have got them thinking. Um, we had a day, Nick Shady, so 2015, like, like Craig had, was a real bad year around home. Um, some areas worse than others. 
So um, we had a bit of a family day, and it wasn't really soils related, more so a community thing. Um, but we got, uh, we just got had got the footy club to do a barbecue catering thing, and we wanted to get families there, so we had a jumping castle and face painting and a magician and stuff. And we got Nick Shady, who's a farmer from down Skipton Way. A lot of you might have heard. He's a real advocate for farmer health and, and mental health and things like that. And he just got, got up and just gave us a talk for a while about, you know, talking with your family and talking with your mates and just trying to keep everyone, you know, just in case anyone was having a rough time. I think it was... Um, and he talks about succession planning as well. So that was just a good community get-together um, that, yeah, the group was able to, to put on and I think... I think was a good benefit at the time. So um, we've had Andrew Bissett and Dale Boyd. Um, Dale works at the department in Echuca and he does a lot of soil moisture stuff. And Andrew Bissett's an agronomist from uh, Serpentine Way. And we had them come and explain, I'll get to it later, but we also got moisture probes in. And so having them there explaining how how to actually read the moisture probes and what benefit you can get from them really <laughs> was really beneficial. Um, Russell Nichols, a spreader calibration expert. Um, so w when you're spreading your ureas and stuff, and we're still using that, um, it would be nice to get away from it, but the reality is we do. You, uh, you can have your spreader calibrated to spread 36 metres, whatever it is, but it doesn't mean that if you're spreading 50 kilos, you might be, some strips might be only getting 30 kilos and some will be getting 70. So you, you're not getting an even spread, and, which means you're overdosing some parts of the paddock, which you know, more losses, more leaching, things like that, it can be an issue. So we got him in, you run the spreaders over some trays, measure some trays out, and with some tweaks on the new spreaders, just tweak the, the veins on the spreaders a bit, and you could get that down to within 5% accuracy just with a few little tweaks. It was, yeah, it was really interesting to see what you can do with that. Um, Simon Faulkner from down south, Megan here, put me onto him, um, Megan Wong. He's from down south, but does a lot of work. He's uh, an agronomist, but he does a lot of work with the subsoil manuring, which is something we've done. And he came up just to help talk about what they've done down in southern farming systems, but also cover cropping um, sort of stuff. Um, we did a bus trip up to Kilter, which is the, um, what do they call themselves, Vic Super crowd that are growing all the cotton and tomatoes up the other side of Kerrang. Um, and that was amazing because some of that dirt there is all just... They had paddocks there, they had just bead bush and stuff growing. You know, it was stuff that you wouldn't even bother putting sheep on most of the time and they had cotton growing right next to it on this soil So and, and loosen and things like that. So, but, um, so it shows what you can do if you've got a lot of money to throw at it, basically, um, which was good. And with GRDC updates, they do them every year in July in... Um, Moama, irrigated cropping ones, go there and you just get bombarded with all good information over there. So we usually just take a bus and whoever wants to come jumps on and heads over there. So we've been able to do all those things to get everyone's knowledge going. Um, Trial-wise, we've done a few. Um, we've done some soil ameliorant trials at the start. So that was trying some compost and gypsum um, trials and we're doing combinations of the both. Um, one of them fell over because it was a dry year and, and the paddock turned out had too much variation across the paddock naturally anyway, so we couldn't really attribute any changes to, to the treatments. But the other one was on a dairy irrigated pasture and I measured that for about two years, bought a rising plate meter, went out there just before and after, he put the cows on. Um, but it really... The, we didn't get the result we would have loved to have got, which was that this compost is going to be a good... Um, replacement for gypsum, it just reinforced how good gypsum is because the two paddocks that didn't have gypsum on them, he'd have to leave them after a wet spell. It'd be about three days later before he could put the cows on it because they'd pug it up. Um, there was times there I was out there when it was wet and where there was no gypsum it was far yellower than where there was. So it just reinforced the value of gypsum on our ground, I guess. Right up. Um, we've tried tillage radish. I probably don't need to go on any more about that, but um, guys have started using that a little bit more. It's not widespread yet, but I think it's going to going to yeah, get more get more purchase. Um, subsoil manuring is one I'm pretty excited about. Uh, so, like I say, they've done a fair bit of work down southern farming systems down south, and it's 
putting, in our case, chicken litter down into where you've got a hard pan. Oh, I think ours was about 25 centimetres down in this particular paddock. Um, and, and trying to keep that hard pan open for roots access. And the theory being that, you know, a lot of people deep rip, but a year or two later that's just sealed back over again and, and you, it's back to the way it was. So this is putting organic matter down there in that in that layer is hoping to keep it open and what they're finding down south is seven years later they're still getting a response because the roots go to that spot and then they break down and, and so they self-replenish the organic matter in this in this zone. So the problem up this way being on trying to do it on dry land is just it's cost prohibitive, it's $1,200 a hectare um, is what they're quoting down there. So it's to get a return off that you've got to grow a heck of a lot of crop. They, they can grow an extra tonne of canola down there in a year, which is 500 bucks a ton, you've got three years you've paid for it and you're going all right, but up here you're just not going to do it. So we decided to try it on irrigation, so moisture is not limiting. First year it was on vetch, and you could sort of see a difference, but we didn't get around to measuring it, um, but you could sort of see a difference. But last year it was a wheat, um, wheat paddock and irrigated, and I think where the subsoil manuring was was 1.2 tonne to the hectare better than the rest of the paddock. And part of that trial we also just ripped one part and then we ripped and manured another part and in another spot, we, another patch, we just put the manure on top so we could sort of try and associate how much is due to the, due to the nu nutrient content and how much is due to the ripping. And, but yeah, the, the combination was far oh, and away better than either. Um, we've done a lot of these trials and as you can tell by the way I'm talking, it's hard to get a measured, the way we've done them, the trials, or as we discussed last night, probably more demonstration sites. It's hard to get a, a value at the end of it, a, a, you know, a result, a solid result to say this is what's happening. So we sort of wanted to try and at the end of it, as a bit of a legacy thing for Colin, um, try and get something, something solid at the end. So we went to the Birchip Cropping Group last year and we got them to do a, um, a pulse trial. We had guys... Uh, part of the cropping rotation, people have been using vetch and peas for quite a few years and faba beans are starting to get used a bit. But we just wanted to see, no one was going to try lentils and lupins and chickpeas and all these things because of the, the history of the soil. So we just wanted to see if maybe now that things are improving a bit, whether we can grow them. So we, two lots of replicated trials in the one paddock. One was a poor part, one was a, a good part of the paddock historically. and. I've just got the results back from that the report the other day and it's quite interesting that um, they did grow but the poor part yielded better um, and what they can put it down to best is it, um, it flowered because it was poor, it was a bit harder and the, the crop flowered a few days earlier and the other stuff that flowered later just copped one of those freak frosts we had and yeah, the seeds all pinched and miserable and yeah, so, so yield wise... Um, yeah, that good stuff didn't really work out, and we, it'd be great to do more trials, and they're sort of working on that. And on the back of that, the Birchip Cropping Group now has started up through funding from the GRDC, has now started a pulse group, growing group in our area. They, they're having groups um, trying to get areas that don't normally grow pulses, see if we can get them going. So that's come off the back of us doing that trial, so I think that's a pretty good legacy as well. Um, we've got a summer crop trial at the moment going. Um, so that's got sorghum, cotton, cowpea, uh, there's loosen was in the paddock anyway, they were sowing, so we've included that. And there was going to be a dual purpose canola as well um, as part of that, but that, yeah, the guy sowing it had a few cedar issues and ended up dumping all our seed on the ground, so that never happened, um, which is unfortunate because that was the one I was pretty excited about to see how that went. The cotton, the, yeah, the guys from up north growing cotton are calling us the deep south cotton. Um, we're about as far south as it's been grown. And there's plenty of interest in that from plenty of people to see if it's going to work. And, and it was looking really promising. We learned a hell of a lot about getting it set up and we were a bit late getting going when we needed you know, getting beds formed and all that sort of stuff. But it, it, it was pretty good. Uh, the cotton was actually looking really promising until about mid-January and we got hit with 2,4-D, as is a common issue spray drift and stuff up north um, and we sort of half expected it might be an issue. It's now been hit three times they reckon. Um, so it sort of made it not viable at the moment because of that. But yeah, it was really interesting that 
without that as an issue, with, yeah, there could be a new new industry set up and improve. By doing that, you'd improve irrigation practices. You know, raised beds and that are, are known to be better better ways of irrigating than just straight floods. So, could have been could have been a good option, but at the moment it's sort of up in the air. But I think um, we had elders involved in doing the agronomy and setting up of that. They did a lot of the work for me. They're actually keen to try it again next year. So, um, that's a good one. And we tried a summer cover crop this year, but it got put in after harvest and it hasn't rained since then, so it hasn't come up. So that's, anyway. We've also got the soil moisture probes and weather stations, um, which have been spoken about. Uh, we tried some drones doing NDVI imaging of paddocks, trying to see what benefit we can get from them. Um, they gave us some lovely pretty pictures, but I think most of us already knew where the poor parts were of our paddock anyway, so in, it, in the guise where we did it, it didn't show a... It showed some interesting stuff, but yeah, how how much real benefit we got from what we were doing, um, I'm not sure. And we've also tried combining our moisture probe weather station data with satellite NDVI imaging um, to look at, and there's algorithms and stuff, but you can use that to get the evapotranspiration rates of the crop and you can work out your yeah, water use efficiencies and stuff like that of your crops. And we we're going to do that, but the, the program, the um, that you looked up all that information on was a bugger of a thing. It only worked through Google Chrome and so people just stopped trying to bother looking it up and yeah, so that was a bit of a shame. Um, I guess I'm going to have to wrap it up pretty quick. Um, our learnings on community-based management and the way this program works, well Craig's already said most of it, I probably don't need to say much more but it's, it's been great. Like people, The guys get together and sit at the pub and you know usually they can throw ideas at, at, at you at the meeting, but usually they've come to me beforehand and said, you know, I'd like to do this or this would be worth doing. So we, you know, you, and and we get we get things happening that the guys are interested in, and so that way they, yeah, it's, you can get them coming because it's stuff they want to see. Um, so that sort of covers covers most of those things. I think people-based approaches and resolving the issues. It's getting them together, and and like Craig said, it's getting them together and talking as guys that maybe wouldn't have talked together. You know, wouldn't have had a lot to do with each other. You know, there's a group that goes to the footy club, but the guys that don't sort of don't blend with them. So we've brought all those guys in together and chatting and sharing ideas. And yeah, it's been great to see. They've, yeah, they've really come together. I reckon as a part of it. So um, that's been good. And yeah, basically, how's that? Yeah, well, it, <laughs> I basically said it. Like the groups, I think the groups really got a lot out of it. Um, you know, we've got guys, well, Tom here is doing a lot of cover cropping and that sort of stuff and, and really doing a lot of those things, so I'm hoping, hoping he's got a bit out of the group uh, leading towards that. But Tom's not the only one. There's guys, you know, there might not be guys going and doing what Grant's doing, but baby steps that way. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty good to see what's, what's going to happen in the future with it. Um, so, yeah, like Craig, I'll just yeah, thank you all and thanks to the CMA and Phil for for giving us the chance, it's yeah, it's been really good, and I've learned a hell of a lot out of it just from my own farm, if nothing else. So, um, yeah, it's it's really been a good opportunity. So, thank you very much.